Welcome back to this week's episode of the WRPF podcast. I'm your host, Alex Uslar. This is episode five. I got my buddy Chris Bridgeford on here. If you guys don't know Chris Bridgeford, it's time to put some respect on his name. All right. Chris Bridgeford has been around competing in powerlifting for almost 10 years now. He's a gym owner. He's our state chair out in Washington for the WRPF. He runs meets. He coaches. He's engaged. He does it all. All right. He's very, very similar to myself. And we're and, and he's still under 30. I just hit 30. Once you once you hit 30, it goes downhill, bro. So just take up this last year and uh, soak it in. All so right. <laughs> I'm very excited to have Chris on. We're going to dive into his his competition history, his business history, being a business owner, all that stuff. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Very, very glad to have you on. Very excited to kind of hear your ups and downs of powerlifting. I think uh, a lot of the different things we'll talk about will be very relatable to people who have been around long in the sport and, you know, kind of the stagnation and the ups and downs and all that stuff. But before we get to the present, let's 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 run it back. Let's take it to the past. So give me a little bit of background about you. Who is Chris Bridgeford? We know you're under 30. We know you're handsome. <laughs> what what were you doing before powerlifting and got you into powerlifting early, early, early in the early days? Uh well, I started powerlifting actually in college while I was wrestling. So I, I wrestled in college. Um and before I actually like did a meet and everything like that, I act, I'd actually uh, done the the West Side for Skinny Bastards routine. I don't know if you ever read about that or heard about that. It was written by Joe DeFranco. So like I, I started doing that like before my freshman year of college, before I left, and you know I was wa- I watched all these videos about you know West Side barbell and like their training and everything like that, and I had no idea that powerlifting was actually a sport. Uh, I started doing, you know, like the box squats and the heavy good mornings and all that stuff. And then uh, going into my sophomore year, uh, one of my friends actually bullied me into doing a meet with him. And let's let's, let's talk dates on this. So what year was this before you first kind of Uh, found the West Side thing that you were doing? So this was like 2012. Okay, uh, this, so this was way before powerlifting was a name that if you said that word to most people, they wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. If you so, if you went into a regular gym and you said powerlifting, they'd look at you like, "What? You mean lifting weight?" So, to like explain this in like uh, Instagram terms, <laughs> this was before you could even post the 15 second clips of oh, video. Yeah. Like this oh, was, yeah. this was when Instagram was strictly photos. Yep. I, and that, 2012 is when I first made my Instagram because I went back recently yeah. and looked at my first post. And I remember sometime in 2012, they released it. Whoa, you could post a video, but how do you decide what the fuck that 15 seconds is going to be? Figure it out. Right? <laughs> yeah. So this is when you're like taking screenshots of like a video of your lift and just posting the screenshot of the lift and saying how many, how much weight and the sets and reps and everything like that. So, right. Uh, so it was my sophomore year, 2000, uh, my, well, that was when I graduated high school was 2012. And then, uh, 2014 beginning of 2014 was actually when I did my first meet. So we're, we're coming up on, on 10 years next year. So year nine this year. So what kind of gym were you training at at this point? Like you said, you kind of found that West side program Were you training at a powerlifting gym. Was it just your university gym? What did that look like? Yeah, university gym uh, primarily. Uh, we got pretty lucky. We found this little like kind of commercial gym. It was it wasn't really like an anytime fitness or anything like that. I think it had been an anytime fitness at one point, and then this guy bought it, uh, and it was kind of like a hybrid like meathead commercial gym type plates. Like he had he had like a Vanco plates. Like he had some some powerlifting equipment like he had a safety spot bar so you know we started going there because it had some of the the basic essentials that we needed to do like box squats and stuff like that you know that was in like the west side plan and like he had chains so you know we went there quite a bit uh but no power no powerlifting gym you know i was training at the you know in the college weight room uh because you know if you were on you know any of the teams you know football wrestling whatever you had access to the the nicer weight room uh, so there was two weight rooms. There was the weight room at the, the rec center. And then there was the nicer like athlete weight room. Uh, so we would go up there and train quite a bit. And then actually 
later that year, um, a guy named uh, Sean Frankel opened opened a powerlifting gym in Sioux City. And I know a lot of people probably aren't going to know who Sean Frankel is, but he's actually one of the like best multiply lifters ever. Like he's pound, pound for pound. He's arguably probably one of the best multiply lifters there is. Uh, I know he's got multi, I mean, he had or still has like multiple all time world records at 198 and 220 uh, in multiply. Uh, so he opened up his own gym in the fall of 2014 uh, called Big Iron. Uh, so we started training there. So uh, my first powerlifting gym I trained at was actually it was primarily a, a multiply gym. So you know I learned how to I learned how to lift like a, a multiply lifter, which you know I'm sure like you as like a coach we've encountered that plenty of times. Like if you get a new client and they're they're squatting super wide, like they're looking straight up at the ceiling, you know they they lift like that. So, you know, I learned a lot of, I learned a lot of things that didn't necessarily carry over to raw lifting the best, but, uh, it was still a great, uh, environment to be in. You know, I learned a lot, uh, you know, about powerlifting being in that setting. Uh, so that was my, that was my first powerlifting gym experience. So it was definitely like the traditional powerlifting gym vibe, you know, where it's all multiply lifters. Uh, the, the gym was actually attached to a, a biker bar. Like the, it was a garage attached to the back of a biker bar. So it definitely, it definitely fit the persona of a powerlifting gym. So, uh, yeah, that was all, uh, before I was even 20 years old. Uh, that was when I was 19. So back in, yeah, back in, uh, 2014. So, yeah. So looking at your open powerlifting history, it's pretty nuts to me. So in 2014, you actually, you actively start competing. You competed three times, but, Let's talk about that the, your third performance that you had, if you remember it, uh, yep. in October of 2014. You just started yep. powerlifting. You squatted 705, benched 402, and pulled 727. 738. 738. You yep. just under a 500 dots. Like right now, 500 mm. dots is a huge accomplishment. 2014, hitting that in wraps, like. <laughs> who knows? I don't think open power thing was around back then. That would have put you really high in the ranks and you were 19 years old and just had found powerlifting that year. That's yeah. pretty freaking nuts. Yeah, I definitely, uh, just by, you know, kind of doing more of a powerlifting like plan. Cause I, I hate to like admit this, but I, I definitely trained more like a, like a crossfitter, uh, when I was wrestling in college, cause like I was trying to balance the two. I was like, okay, like I really love lifting heavy, but I also need to be in shape. So, you know, I would kind of do a blend of, you know, like I would do my heavy lifts and then the rest of my workout would be, you know, like a Metcon or, you know, whatever the, the dumb terms you want to use there. So, um, uh, but yeah, my, my third meet, I, I, yeah, like you said, I, I, that was, I competed at 242. 7, yeah, 705 and 738 pole of the bench we don't really need to talk about um i think powerlifting watch i don't know if you remember powerlifting watch oh, yeah. but yep that was what actually was used for the, right. the ranking um, they were based in florida that, i remember see, seeing them around they'd come to meets down here and i think i finished 2014 i think i finished the year i think i still have the screenshot on my phone uh, cause they released like the, the rankings for the year at the end of the year, like December. And I think I finished 2014, like number 18 in the world for like that year, not all time, but for the year. Uh, and like, and I think my total was like 1850 or 1846. And like, I think now like an 1850 total, like you're maybe in the top 100 at 242. Right. And that was was it what was that ranking based off of total for weight class or was that ranked off of your well they didn't use dots I think it was Wilkes still back then right that was, that was based off total so off total. yeah uh I don't I don't remember where I was based off of the Wilkes I actually like I had no idea like what Wilkes was like I never paid like I I think I got uh I got best lifter at that meet and I didn't even know how I got best lifter like I thought it was I didn't real I didn't know what Wilkes was I didn't pay attention to that right. <laughs> I, well, I remember like... I remember around that time because that's when I started powerlifting 2014 and watching like pro raw raw watching big dogs watching all those different meets you know uh rum and stuff it's like you just you wanted to see Dan Green, Brandon Lilly, everyone total over yeah. 2K, right? It was really just about the <clears> total for the most part at that time because for the most part, it was all big motherfuckers. And you were only 19, but you were 242. So you were 
built for sure. You were built like a motherfucker, you know? So no one really cared about 165, 181 pound man, you know, doing whatever, except that one guy who was a freaky deadlifter. I forget his name. But uh, the ant or something like that, they, they nicknamed him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know what I'm talking about. His name, I know the animal talking guy. About. Yeah, yeah, but besides that, it was all big guys, right? Yeah, that was like the, they call that like the golden era of powerlifting. Because, yeah, it was like, it was Dan, Brandon, Lily. Uh, it was like here. Uh, I think uh, Misha from Russia was still competing. Uh, KK was still competing. So all these. Andre Manojev, yep. All just big guys and they're fucking jacked. So. <laughs> And that was like my only goal when I started lifting, when I started competing was I want to total 2K at 242. That was because like I saw Dan, I saw Dan doing it. I saw all these other guys. I was like, okay, 2K at 242, like that's my goal. I like specifically had a goal of totaling higher than uh, Casey Williams. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you know who that is. He's a elite FTS guy. You know, I think he was like number five or number six all time at the time at 242 and i had followed him since i started lifting like i loved watching him compete and i loved watching him lift so that was like my goal was to total higher than him and like i just wanted to be in the top five at 242 and uh i actually like got to the point where you know if you if you're looking through my my meets on open powerlifting i i did a few meets at 275 because the weight cut to 242 got a little too difficult for a little while there. And then, so I went up to 275 for a couple of meets. I actually got my first 2k at 275. And then I competed in my first U S open in 2017 at 275. And then I actually went back down to 242 for a couple of meets. I, I got my shit together. I learned how to, I learned how to diet properly instead of trying to cut 20 pounds. And I actually managed to compete at 242 for a couple more meets and then I, in 2017, I actually competed at Boss of Bosses. And I think this was one of their, I think this was like their first meet as WRPF mm -hmm. um, in 2017. Yep. And uh, I ended up totally, I totaled 2144 in that meet, which put me number five all time at, at the time. I'm like, I'm like 17 now. <laughs> I've definitely dropped, I've dropped down a few, a few spaces, but at the time that put me that put me number five at 242 so i was like lifetime goal like achieved uh for you know at that point in time anyway so it was definitely kind of a you know a roller a roller coaster ride the first couple of years i was pretty hell-bent on on staying at 242 and i had a couple crappy meets because of it i bombed out i bombed out of a meet in 2016 uh i think yeah, it was 2000 2016 or 2015 trying to make it to 242 and i did make 242 but i was just so i was so drained on meet day that i just had nothing in the tank and i was too i was too stubborn to like change my op openers or anything like that so i just bombed out <laughs> let's 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 talk about that because being 242 pounds even when you're 19 and then you were cutting to be that we talked about boom when you found powerlifting what were you doing even earlier than that were you always just a big ass kid when you were wrestling did you play football did you lift weights early on like what got you to be such a such a <laughs> unit, you know yeah i mean well i, I, was, I, I was 19 years old i weighed 165 pounds bro at six yeah. three, you know? well, uh i i grew up i grew up on a farm in the middle of middle of nowhere iowa so grew up eating uh corns <laughs> them so, gmos yeah. baby them yeah. gmos uh, Corn, corn fed fuck as they as they call it so i uh, i started lifting when i was like 11 years old i found this like old like crappy weight set in our shed on our on our property we had the shed that was like left there from the person before that lived there before us you know like the old weight sets where they're like filled with like concrete mm -hmm. like so i found one of those like it was like this really like skinny bar it yep, was like one of yeah the it was like one of those skinny benches where like your hands had to be on the outside of it. And there was all these plates that were, you know, they were like plastic, but they had concrete on the inside of them. So I started using that and uh, I had no idea what I was doing. Literally all I did, I did bench and curls. I didn't do anything else. Uh, and then my, my older sister, her boyfriend at the time actually like offered to start 
he would come pick me up in the morning at like six and then he would take me into the high school with them because our town was so small that the elementary school and the high school were all one building. So like we had, I think, uh, a total of like 300, 400 kids in the whole school, high school and elementary, middle school combined. That's nuts. Uh, like in my class, I think there was like 40 kids total. Uh, so start, started lifting when I was really young. Uh, you know, just grew up doing a lot of outside, you know, manual labor, farm work, stuff like that with my dad. Uh, he's a contractor as well. So I got roped into doing a lot of the the stuff that none of the other people that he hired really wanted to do. So I was kind of like the bottom of the barrel guy for my dad uh, growing up. Spent a lot of summers in New Orleans, actually, because uh, he went he went down there after Hurricane Katrina and picked up a lot of job contracts, kind of helping like rebuild the whole city. Uh my dad actually helped rebuild the dam that's on the outside of, uh, I think it's Lake Pontchartrain. Um, so spent a, spent a few summers in New Orleans, uh, just working construction the whole fucking summer <laughs> in the, in that great, like Southern humidity. It was awful. So yeah, I lifted, uh, started lifting really early on. I started wrestling in junior high, uh, played football as well, but like I fell in love with wrestling right away. Uh, I don't know why it was just something about like the individuality of it, like was really nice for me. Uh, so kind of like poured all my energy into getting better at wrestling. Uh, and then my, my freshman year of high school, I actually transferred to a different school that was about 20 minutes away. That was a very, very prominent wrestling school. And, you know, eventually I got, I got better enough to, you know, get a varsity spot and then my my junior year I qualified for state and then my seventh uh my senior year I ended up uh placing at state and getting on the podium got a wrestling scholarship and then I was able to you know the only reason I went to college was because I got a wrestling scholarship so uh so yeah all those things kind of combined you know I, I you know I started started lifting pretty early on, you know, got into wrestling and then kind of you know used lifting as you know a means to get better at wrestling. Uh, <clears throat> and just really, really enjoyed training. Really enjoy, you know, that was, I didn't really do a lot of social things. Uh, I was kind of a, I was kind of an outsider, uh, at the school that I went to because, you know, everybody I went to school with, they had all known each other since they were like three or four years old. You know, they grew up in that town. Everybody knew each other. And I was this kid that came in, you know, freshman year of high school. And, uh, you know, like I had friends through sports, you know, that was kind of like my, my outlet to be social with other people. Uh, but like, I didn't really get invited to, you know, I didn't get invited to stuff on the weekends and things like that. So I spent my free time, uh, I spent my free time lifting weights and, uh, that was, you know, that's kind of how like lifting became like a part of my like lifestyle, I guess. Uh, and I've been, you know, been hooked on it ever since. So so what I'm inferring is we talk about a lot about people's athletic history, athletic backgrounds, giving them a great foundation for for powerlifting or other sports or whatever it may be. Me, I'm the example of someone who didn't do jack shit till I was 19, except be 165 pounds and sell and do drugs. You know, not the best athletic background <laughs> as base. But here's what missing. Here's what's missing. If you guys grew up playing all kinds of sports and you're still not to the totaling 2K, but you're an elite level lifter. You just got to eat more corn. Yep. Eat more corn, eat more red meat. That's like, that's literally all we ate. It was corn, red meat, potatoes. It was, yeah. It was pretty basic. I love it. I love yeah. it. I love it. I think I, I think I weighed 165 when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> Put that into perspective. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. So you, you, yeah. you bulked in high school. You bulked. Yeah. Pretty much. I think I was, I think I was like 210 my senior year. And then my freshman year of college, I was like 215 to 220. And I cut down to, I wrestled at 197 my freshman year of college. Uh, but I walked around at about like 215 to 220. So I've been cutting weight for a long time, which is like why I'm kind of like probably stuck on cutting weight. Like it's hard for me to stop doing it because I cut weight for so long for the sport that I did before powerlifting. And then I just kind of, I, you know, I actually started competing while I was still wrestling. So my first three meets, uh, the meet where I actually did, you know, hit the, the seven thirty eight deadlift, uh, and then the seven Oh five squat. I did that during preseason, my, uh, my junior year. So like I was, 
I was doing two a days for wrestling and peaking for that meet at the same time. So like I was doing, we were doing conditioning on Tuesdays and Thursdays where we would, we would run, you know, as long as the coach wanted us to run. And then we would go do hill sprints after we ran for distance. And then we had required team lifting three times a week. And then I was lifting on my own outside of that. So, uh, so I was actually still wrestling uh, my first few meets that I did in, uh, during that like college time frame when I was 18, 19. So uh, definitely wasn't easy to, it wasn't really easy to, to balance the two. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So let, let, let's, fla- let's fast forward back to 2017. Like you said, you finally hit that check mark. You hit the 2K at 242. You know, you, you had done a couple of 275. Where did you go from there? What did you figure what was next? Like, I know the all-time world records were were lower at that time. Were you chasing all-time world records? Were you looking at any other things? Like- <clears throat> uh, so that was, I had actually just moved to Washington at that point. Uh, I moved I moved here to Washington in the fall of 2017. Uh, prior to that, uh, living in Iowa, I'd worked as a, I'd worked as a CEO for about a year. Uh, was actually pretty heavy on pursuing a career in law enforcement. And then after my first U.S. Open, you know, up, up until that point, I, you know, I've been programming for a couple friends and stuff like that. You know, they were paying me like 50 bucks a month or, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. Uh, so after my first U.S. Open, uh, I, you know, I took on, you know, I started taking on some more clients uh, just because, you know, I got a little bit more, Instagram notoriety, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I thought I actually that just was, that about was the 2017 US Open, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah I was there. I remember that was that was the that was the infamous one with the judging, right? Oh, uh, that was 2018. Okay. Uh, I mean 2017 was also strict, but 2018 is the one where like uh an entire flight like got red lighted on squats. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, that was the one that was in like the San Diego like event. Yes. Set. Huge, 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 uh, overly oversized venue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 2017 was the one that they had at, at the fairgrounds at, at Del Mar. Uh, right. and that was that was when it was still uh, USPA. Right. I, I believe it was still USPA. Uh, so, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. So, yeah. So then uh, I, I did my first US Open, and I actually just talked about this with Trevor, where I definitely, like, I was one of those people where starting out, like I got clients because more so of like my notoriety as like a lifter, not because like I had established myself as like a good coach or anything like that. So uh, I have no problem. I had no problem admitting that. Uh, so I started getting more clients and then um, I was like, okay, like I'm, you know, I'm making enough money from this. Like I can pay my bills doing this. This is pretty cool. Uh, and then I, you know, I got a couple in-person clients when I was still living in Iowa and I was like, all right, like I, you know, this is, this is like pretty easy and I enjoy this. Like I can, you know, I get to tell people how to lift weights and, you know, make money off of it. So that's cool. And then, uh, my girlfriend at the time was actually, you know, moving to Washington for work, uh, and was like, Hey, like, why don't you come with? Cause like, I was already, I was pretty sick and tired of living in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I was looking, you know, I was looking for opportunities elsewhere. I was, you know, there was a lot of places I was thinking about moving. Um, she was like, why don't you, you know, move to Washington with me? So I was like, okay, cool. I'll move to Washington. I never, like I hadn't been to Washington. I had never, you know, I'd never seen the state or anything. So like my first, when I moved out here, it was also my first time seeing everything. So I didn't come, I didn't come check out the city or anything like that and like get my bearings. Like my first time I was here was when I moved here. (laughs) So, you know, driving out here and like seeing the mountains and everything like that, I was like, wow, this is, this is really different. Like pretty good decision. (laughs) Yeah, it was a great decision. And like, I'll stand by that, uh, you know, forever. Like I'll, I'll never go back to the Midwest, like not a chance. Uh, But, you know. Coming out here and like not seeing any cornfields, just seeing like giant, like evergreen trees and mountains and stuff like that. I was like, okay, like this is kind of cool. Uh, so I moved out here and started coaching more full time and, you know, still competing. So, uh, you know, after that, uh, you know, Boss of Bosses, which was uh, about a month, a month after I moved here was when I competed in Boss of Bosses. Uh, 
I, you know, I try, I tried compete, I tried competing again shortly after that. And I, because the all-time world record was still held by Dan Green. It was still the 2204 that he held for a long time. So I was like, I'm 60 pounds away. I can break this. Like, I was like, I totaled 2144, like while in the middle of moving across the country. I was like, if I just have 10 weeks of like no interrupted training, you know, I can, I can break it. So <clears throat> I popped right back into a meat prep. I signed up for record breakers in 2017 and I actually like strained my, I strained my quad uh, going into that meet. So I ended up bombing out of that meet too. <laughs> that was my second bomb out that I had. Uh, and then I didn't compete again until the 2018 current U S open uh, where I, I think I, I only totaled, I think I tied my meet PR on that meet. I don't think I uh, PR in any way. For that and that was kind of at the point where you know i was <clears throat> kind of struggling to keep my weight under 260 again and it was getting a little it was getting a little difficult again like i had a couple meets where it was you know with getting my diet in order like it was pretty easy to get back down there but by 2018 um uh, when i competed in that current us open and then i i competed in the tribute meet later that year i was like okay like this is getting really difficult. Like I'm having to diet like really, really strict to like keep my weight at 260 and then cutting 18 pounds. Like this is, this is a little too much. So uh, I decided to go back up to 275 again. And that's where you totaled the thousand. Yep. That's where I finally got the, the thousand kilo total. Uh, that's actually the meat where like I, I came the closest to pulling 900 in competition. Like I literally, I was, I had like, one more inch to go like i literally was stood i was stood up with the weight and then i fell forward at the top i lost my balance uh so that's like my my infamous like i i almost had it uh i think i've i have a, a couple a couple of friends that like to joke around and say that i have the world record for most 900 attempts in a meet <laughs> uh for the most most times missing 900 in competition which is true i've, I've missed it a handful of times uh so yeah, uh, totaled the thousand kilo, thousand kilos there, and then uh, going into 2019, uh, I actually I competed in the U.S. Open again at 275, and this was actually kind of this was kind of in the middle of getting the gym started. Uh, so I was kind of balancing, getting everything in order for uh, getting the gym up and running, and uh, me didn't go that well just because I didn't really have any like regard for like the the stress of starting a business and starting a gym and how that might impact training uh so i didn't do very great in the 2019 open and then uh shortly following that i actually uh blew blew my quad tendon off off the bone so that was kind of like the next big big life event for me uh in 2019 so that was uh it was definitely you know the we talked about the highs and lows that's so definitely like getting getting down there into the into a low point uh because i just opened a gym and then you know i tear you know had all these plans for the year and all these things i wanted to do and then i couldn't do any of it because i was you know i was crippled for about six months is that kind of what also led you to transfer more more over to the raw side yeah so it t it took me a while to even like I I was clear to squat for a couple months and I still intentionally avoided it uh just because like here I was like not I was not squared away uh I was very scared to squat again just because squatting was like one of those was the lift for me uh you know being a long long femured individual you know squatting you know I didn't really have an excuse to like be bad at it i just it was not something i enjoyed uh i also like learned to squat the wrong way which was like you know i learned to squat like a multiply lifter so you know i was always like dealing with hip pain things like that and i like didn't discover until you know about a year like year and a half after my my quad surgery that like you know, squatting with a narrow stance isn't a bad thing. You know, using your quads isn't a bad thing, you know, things like that. And these were all things that like I preached to people. I just never like considered it for myself. So, you know, after my, after my surgery, you know, I took, 
uh, a good, you know, when I was finally like mentally squared away enough to like force myself to squat, force myself to do these things. I like really like intent, like devoted myself to like rebuilding my squat. Uh, so a big part of that was, uh, was training and competing raw. You know, I told myself that I wouldn't put wraps on again until I could squat, you know, 800 pounds in sleeves because, you know, at this point, you know, we're getting into 2019, 2020, a lot of people at 242 and even 220 are squatting 800 in sleeves. <laughs> and I think the most I've and, ever... Squatted. And 181, shout out my boy, Jawan. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> no, we don't need to talk about him. We, we that. that guy is... That guy is insane. I don't know. I don't know how. And like, let alone alone, alone in his garage, he can squat. Yeah. Pounds. That is insane. Uh, so, you know, there's there's all these guys that are, you know, squatting way more than me at a lower weight class and sleeves. So I'm like, all right, like, you know, I'm not putting wraps on until I can, you know, at least squat over 700 in sleeves. So that was the goal. Um uh, and we, we hit that last year, you know, I did the competed in the hybrid meet at the start of, uh, 2020, uh, 2022, uh, I actually went back down to 242 for another meet, uh, just because, you know, I lost, you know, I lost a little bit of weight, uh, over the last couple of years and, uh, totaled 2039 at 242 in sleeves. So it was my first, it was like my, that was my second sleeve meet ever as my first 2k in sleeves. Uh, so I was able to mark that one off the off the goal list i was pretty happy with that but i only squatted 705 and i'm pretty sure uh blake lahue squatted the same as me in that meet he, i think he squatted he either i think he squatted close to 705 or he did squat 705 at uh 181 so i was like all right like there's still guys a few weight classes lower than me you know squatting just as much as me but like at least we're we're improving at least <laughs> so yeah I love it. So I got I got a ton of different questions. We we covered so much ground and it was a perfect background of your history. So now oh. we're going to kind of pull back and dive into some of those different pieces that we've talked about. So we've talked about your last couple of years and the injury and starting businesses and building businesses. And the question I want to ask you is how do you and do you and how can you improve upon how do you manage competing and coaching at a high level? Because I know I saw you alone at the American Pro this past year, and you know you weren't competing till the second day, or whatever it was, and you were in there the entire first day coaching this, that, and the other. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, man? So how yeah. do you manage it? And how do you see yourself improving managing it? I think there's, I think there's two routes you can go. Like realistically, uh, I've talked to, I've talked to Jaffe quite a bit about this. I've talked to Dave Osborne about this because they're both, they both compete and they both compete with their clients and they both handle their clients while they're competing. So, I think if you're gonna compete with clients or friends, things like that, I think you need to go go in with the expectation that it's gonna be for fun, which is something I really struggle with doing. Yeah, I like I. I can't do something unless I'm like going in with the intention of doing it. Like you're no half best and improving. Yeah, no, like, no half assing, full assing only. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, look at your your powerlifting history. That's what most your career was, right? So have to having to try to reset that is difficult. Yeah. So it was either shift the perspective and go in with the intention of like just having fun, can treat it like an SBD day that you're doing in the gym. Have a good time, enjoy doing it with your friends, which, you know, again, that's something I've struggled with doing. Or do not compete at the same meet that you have clients competing at. So, you know, that was kind of like a, a real conversation I had to have with myself and I had like with people around me where they're like, you know, like I, I can compete at a high level. Yes, that's great. But that still doesn't pay the bills, right? the people that pay me that are competing at these meets are the people that that's what pays the bills, right? I'm a coach first. I'm a lifter second, right? I don't, I don't identify as a power lifter. I identify as a coach more so. Uh, so that, you know, that was, and that was a, a, a situation where, you know, I admittedly did not do the right thing. If I'm like being completely transparent, you know, I had, I had, you know, I made sure ahead of time that like people were, were squared away. Uh, and they had what they needed uh, during the meet. Uh, and then, you know, I ended up, uh, I bombed, I bombed out of the American pro. <laughs> so that was my, that was my third bomb out. And, uh, 
instead of, you know, instead of staying and like helping, you know, helping my lifters, making sure they were good. Cause I had people competing on the same day as me. I just left the meet completely. And, you know, looking back, it's like, okay, I should have stayed and supported my lifters and, you know, made sure that they were okay. Been there for them, whatever. But I just was so, I was just in, like, I wasn't in coach mode. I was in athlete mode. So this is like where I was like, you know, making the realization that it's like, you know, you need to shift the perspective here and remember like what your job is. And then, like I said, you know, if I'm going to compete, if I'm going to be in athlete mode, then find a meet and like communicate ahead of time, you know, with clients, make sure that like, you know, if, if I'm going to do the American pro, all right, if I have four people doing it or five people doing it, whatever, I'm going there as a coach, not as a lifter, which is actually the case this year. I think right now I have, I have four or five people that are actually signed up and I have a couple other people that are like on the wait list or whatever that are trying to get in. So it's like, all right, I'm going to the American pro this year, but I'm not coaching or I'm not competing. I'm not competing. I'm coaching. So, and you know, we've had some other situations in the past where, you know, if we have, you know, I've, I've competed with friends and, you know, if we have other, you know, if we have other friends that are coming with to, that are not competing, they're kind of able to help out and make sure we're all squared away. And you know, if they need to wrap knees or whatever, uh, but that doesn't necessarily always work just because, you know, traveling, you know, paying for plane tickets, Airbnbs, things like that. We're not always able to take a group of like 10 people to a meet. Uh, it'd be nice if we could. But it's not necessarily, you know, in the real world, you know, people can't just always, you know, we can't always afford to travel the meets uh, for things like, you know, things like that. So, uh, so that was kind of, you know, the big, the big change for me was, you know, if, if I have people competing at a big meet, you know, whether it was, you know, it was the same thing with your meets, which you know, I've wanted to do the ghost meet like three years in a row now. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I've, had to like make the choice not to because i've had at least i've had at least four people doing your meets every year <laughs> so it's it like, makes okay. it more difficult because it's not just pro you also have the amateur aspect and some of your other lifters want to make it out to that see the other pros compete yeah i get it i think sure. uh 2022 uh i actually i was i was signed up for your meet and uh i was gonna i was actually gonna do your meet i wasn't gonna do the hybrid meet and then I had, I think I had seven people at your meet last year. I had, I had like four, I had three or four on the amateur day. And then I had another four, I had another four on the pro day. So I was like, if I had like two or three on just one day, like, yeah, like we could make that work. But I had a handful of people on both days. So I was like, I'm just going to go to coach. Uh, so hybrid was actually my second option. Uh, no offense to anybody hybrid affiliate. <laughs> watching uh it was my second option for the meet so uh for sure so segueing into that exact same thing turning powerlifting into a career right for you it was an evolution where you were a powerlifter for a very long time before it became your career for me uh, fitness was in uh, fitness i say fitness because it wasn't powerlifting first and my career were both like on the exact same timeline like i start when i started fitness is pretty much when i started as my, my as my career and uh when i found powerlifting right away i kind of formed a powerlifting club and we were all following along the, the cube method you know air, uh oh yeah and, yeah and, yeah so for me i know that uh i've struggled with it being a hobby or something that I enjoy doing, something that I did love, love, love doing for many years, while it's also my career. Have you found kind of your perspective on it at all has changed, especially with opening a gym? Because I think we're in a much more unique position as well as a lot of people that it might be their career, that they're an online coach or whatever it is, you know, but like they're working from wherever they want as opposed to also being a gym owner who's also someone who loves or loved powerlifting. Do you feel like it's kind of changed your outlook at all on competing in, in any way like that? Uh, absolutely. I, you know, I definitely, there was a point, uh, there was a point in time for me where uh, competing was, was absolutely. And like, we run into people like this all the time and not that there's, necessarily anything wrong with this depending on the person but for me there was a point in time where competing was like the only thing that i had that was like providing me with fulfillment like i didn't have i didn't have any hobbies outside of the gym 
anything like that. You know, I didn't, I literally only trained and I didn't, I didn't have a social life. Uh, you know, I was the typical power lifter that like, didn't, you know, in, you know, do any of like the family stuff, you know, like I missed out on holidays and stuff like that. Uh, so you know, there was, there was definitely like an unhealthy, uh, point in time and with, uh, with competing, and I, I definitely would say that that indirectly contributed to my quad tear. Um, Cause like, I didn't, I wasn't very active outside of the gym. Like, you know, the stuff that like you see me, you know, posting now occasionally, like, you know, like we've talked about hiking and things like that. And uh, you know, I've, I've sent you some of the stuff that we've done on the weekends. And like, I wasn't doing any of that. Like even when I first moved here and I had all this stuff around me, like I didn't, I wasn't, going you know i wasn't getting out in the outdoors on the weekend like i wasn't active uh like i had a pretty like unhealthy typical unhealthy power lifter lifestyle um so you know kind of when i when i got hurt um and i couldn't i couldn't train and i had a lot more time to focus on you know my clients and my lifters that was kind of where things kind of my perspective kind of shifted i was like okay like I'm not going to be doing this forever. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to compete at a high level and, you know, for the next whatever, 20 years and, you know, actively coaching more and more people and going to competitions and helping and helping, uh, lifters, uh, you know, the, the feeling of like seeing somebody that like you work with, seeing them like get that, uh, success and get that moment when they like complete a lift on a platform. Uh, like I knew right away, like after experiencing that, uh, while I was injured, I was like, this doesn't really like the feeling I get when I'm on the platform doesn't compare it to this. Like it was a very, very different feeling. Like, yeah, the feel, you know, for me, like when I'm on the platform, I'm, I'm pretty anxious the, the whole time. Like I'm just trying to ignore the fact that there's a crowd of people in front of me. Uh, whereas like when I'm kind of standing off to the side and I'm seeing, you know, the person that I've been working with, you know, when they have their, you know, their moment of success, they hit a PR, uh, the feeling was like night and day different. So, uh, getting, you know, getting injured and, you know, open like, and then, you know, opening the gym while being injured and, you know, kind of being forced to focus more on coaching and being out of athlete mode for a while, uh, definitely kind of forced that perspective change for me. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've like accepted the fact, you know, for a, you know, a while now that like competing is, is, you know, a means to an end. Um, you know, we've talked about this, you know, outside of, outside of now, you know, I'm, I'm at the point now where, um, you know, like I've been doing this for 10 years on the competitive side, I'm ready to take a step back and focus on, on some other things. And, you know, like me and Courtney are engaged. So, you know, we're talking about having kids, you know, in the next, you know, two years or so less than two years would be ideal. So not necessarily willing to do the things that I would need to do to continue to peak, you know, try to get past where I've gotten to at this point. You know, if I realistically, if I wanted to try to break an all time world record or try to make it in like the top three all time, like I would have to push past what I've already been willing to do. And I'm not, I'm really not willing to do that at this point. I'm, I'm a lot more worried about, being a better coach, you know, starting a family with Courtney, you know, getting, getting the gym to a point where it's, you know, self-sustaining and, you know, able, you know, able to run on its own. So, uh, a lot of like harsh, harsh wake up calls. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. You nailed it. Cause ultimately this question when I was leading to is kind of advice for people who want to turn into a career, or open a gym, but to kind of recap what you said, cause it's like those, that's exactly what I've experienced over the years and what I've gone through. It's like to, to compete, at a high level, you have to be very selfish, right? To compete in powerlifting or to even be an athlete in general, you have to be selfish as fuck. And it has to be like, that has to be your complete focus. If you look at any professional athlete or whatever it is, sure, they might have some downtime in an off season, but then it's it's right back in a game mode. Goodbye, family. Don't look at me, family. All that kind of stuff. And although powerlifting is also hobby-ish, to really do it at a very high level and to, you have to make a lot of those sacrifices. So it's like when you want to also own businesses that are going to take a lot of your heart and your soul, it's super, super difficult or honestly impossible to do them both well, 
You know, if you're trying to do them both, you're probably, you know, neglecting your clients or whatever it is. And then again, when you just get into online coaching as a business, that's completely different than other business ventures like what we have, you know, like having a gym where, you know, there's there's an overhead. What overhead do you have in online coaching? Absolutely none. You know, you have so much risk when it comes to having a gym, so many headaches, so many issues that you're constantly being faced with. But I'll tell you, I know you feel the same way. The fulfillment that you have is 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 unlike anything. Like what we just talked about, that evolution of that fulfillment from coaching. It's like I experienced that first also working at other gyms. That fulfillment of seeing your clients progress and doing well and how stoked they get. But then that fulfillment that you get when you have a gym and you have a community and you have a home that you know you created for all these people and they just like, you know, they love you so much for it. You love them for supporting it. It's it, it's honestly unlike anything that it makes those sacrifices so worth it. And then I could even compare it to the extent of a of, of freaking fatherhood. You know, it's like now being a father that I have had my kid, my son's a little over a year old. It's like that fulfillment that you have, that you're able to give, you're able to provide. And it's like, you can't balance all those things, you know, you, no. as far as competing and stuff goes. So it's like yeah. my advice. And I'm sure yours would be for anyone who's in this field, because Chances are, if you're wanting to make a career out of this, it's because you do it personally yeah. and you love it. You know what I mean? I seriously doubt you're wanting to make a career out of it. And you've never competed in powerlifting or know nothing about powerlifting. So you got to be ready. To, yeah, you got to be ready to make. You, there is, there is for sure. You got to be ready to make serious damn sacrifices and know it's 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 going to be tough, but the fulfillment is second to none. Yeah, I would, that's pretty spot on. You know, that's. I had a, a little a harsh reality check last year, you know, when I was training for the American pro, like I definitely switched into like athlete mode. And when you're, when you're being that selfish and when, you know, when you're putting that much time into yourself, it is really, really difficult to be empathetic to other people. Uh, at least for me, it was, uh, which makes it really, really hard to be a coach because, you know, as a coach, like that's kind of one of like the cornerstones of, like a personality trait of a good coach is they, they have a lot of empathy. Like you can relate, you can relate to people, you can meet them at their level. Like you can see where they're at and you can help them, you know, get better. Uh, so for me, it was, it was very, it was very difficult to be empathetic during that time. Uh, and I've had plenty of, you know, conversations with, you know, clients that are, you know, they're still with me or clients that stopped working with me during that time frame just because, you know, admittedly, like I wasn't doing as good of a job as a coach as I should have. And that's, you know, kind of going into everything we just talked about. You know, it's like you, if you want to be an athlete at a high level, that's fine. If you want to be a coach at a high level or a gym owner as, at a high level, that's fine. Like you just need to be honest with yourself about what that entails. And I think the issue is when people, think that they can handle more than like, there's nothing wrong with saying like, I like, yeah, like I can't handle coaching at this capacity if I'm going to compete at a high level. Like there's nothing wrong with saying that there's nothing wrong with admitting that. And that's probably something I should have admitted last year around this time was like, okay, like I cannot handle working with this many clients. If I'm going to devote the next six months to pushing my body as, as far as high as I can possibly go. Uh, so just, you know, kind of working to have the self-awareness or maturity, like in the, in the situation to, to be honest about those things. So, uh, because outside looking in, you know, I've, I've had conversations with, you know, with people where like, it seems like I don't, you know, I don't, well, it doesn't seem like I don't put as much, I haven't put as much effort into developing the gym as I should have, because I'm more focused on myself. And I also have remote coaching as <clears throat> as a career as well. So trying to balance three of those, let alone two of those, uh, was not something that I was doing a great job of. So there's been, there's been a lot of, uh, learning experiences along the way and a lot of adjusting. Uh, but again, you know, kind of coming, you know, along with the gym, having a community and having support, uh, makes a huge difference. Um, uh, I don't even know if I would still have the gym, if it wasn't for Courtney and if it wasn't for the people around me that said, you know, the impact that the gym had on them. And I, like, I had no idea, like, you know, I don't, I don't hear these things. Like I said, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of the touchy feely conversations with people. Cause that's, you know, it's something that's you know difficult for me. But when I had, you know, a couple people tell me, you know, how, 
much the gym did for them and you know how you know they they consider the gym you know it's like home for them and the people they've met at the gym is you know it's life you know life changing relationships whatever so uh you know those are the things like you know if i didn't have those things if i didn't have courtney you know i don't even know if the gym would still be a real thing but uh you know here we are <laughs> well i'll tell you what man something that's super important is being able to to be a successful business owner to be a successful person in life in general you have to be able to reflect and have self awareness you know if you're one of those people that you're always in denial of your actions of what's happening or you just write it off and you just keep doing it the way it is that's just a recipe for disaster you know it's like if you would have kept going down that road then mate you probably wouldn't still have the gym your business would still be suffering whatever it is so the fact that you have the self awareness to look at it reflect and correct like that just that that those are the steps that you need to continue success and to keep moving in the right direction but so many people lack those traits in life in general and that's where just things just land slide down you know like er- everything every move that you do in life is is a learning lesson and a possible learning experience and it depends what you take of it you know I- i'm only a-, a year or two older than you but it's like i've been grinding for a really long time and my career's come first for a very long time so it's like i've learned a lot of those things along the way and then it's like when you have all that self awareness you know it's I've gotten to the point in my life and my career that it's like everything I do is external and hardly anything is actually for me. But I get so much actual fulfillment from all those external things, you know, and putting on 27 different hats that are not necessarily for me, you know. Yeah. But yeah. I'm I'm also just a fucking lunatic and I'm a one of one. So yeah. well, that's why you know, that's why you're one of the people that like I reach out to, you know, I've I've reached out to you with some some random questions here and there, but you know, that's why like I you know, I, I reach out to the people that I do because I'm, I'm okay with like admitting when like I'm the student in a situation. I think that's a big, a big part of it is, uh, you know, like I'll, I'll reach out to other coaches, you know, in situations where I don't necessarily have the answer to the question. And, you know, that could be another piece of advice, I guess, if you want is, you know, being, being okay with like taking criticism and advice from other people, you know, I reach out to you, I reach out to other gym owners, meet directors as well. Uh, you know, I reach out to, uh, Garrett, he'll love that all that I name dropped him here. Uh, his ego will love that, but I've, you know, I've reached out to Garrett and you and other people in terms of directing meets and doing a better job at that. Uh, you know, I've reached out to other coaches to be a better coach and, you know, it helps, you know, knowing when you're the student in the situation and not the teacher uh, or, you know, however you want to word that, uh, I think goes goes a long way. So and I think uh, I think being able to do both is also extremely important. You need to always be willing to learn and to listen, but like give back also, you know, like when you learn that knowledge, give it back to people and, you know, it's, it's only going to help them, you know, in, in, yeah. in the long run. Hell yeah, absolutely. So one of the last questions I have for you, it's it's funny because I'll, I'll now word it differently. My last question was any future competition goals you may have, but we've kind of talked about what maybe the future of your powerlifting looks like, maybe taking a step back. So I'll even word it as future competition goals or just life and career goals in general. You mentioned you're getting married, <clears throat> possible children. What else? Yeah, uh, so september uh might actually be uh one of my last meets for a while uh i'm planning i'm signed up for the uh the power surge meet in september uh in chicago um you know my uh my client and good friend uh ed blair uh he's helping run the meet that's where he trains and he's he's been a friend of mine for a long time Uh, i actually started coaching him when i still lived in iowa uh so he's like the OG. longest longest yeah he's an og client like he's literally like one of like the first five people i ever coached uh so you know he's been with me since day one uh you know he asked me if i wanted to do the meet and you know i had already you know been considering the fact that this might be my la- last meet for a few years uh depending on how it goes uh so i was like yeah like if there was a meet where like this was going to be like my my last meet for a while like you know he's like i said he's a great friend of mine He's been with me since day one, you know, that'd be the meet that I would do. Uh, so, you know, my, my, my biggest goal for that meet is to just finally like pull 900 
in competition just because like that's that was like my overarching goal for a long time i pulled 900 in the gym for the first time like almost i did that in 2016 so it's been however many seven years seven years ago i pulled 900 for the first time granted it was like it was with pound plates and straps but i you know it's i've pulled 900 so many times over the years the fact that i haven't done it in competition is like is really the only like regret or like thing on my checklist with powerlifting that like keeps me awake at night. Like, you know, I had, I had a lot of big goals, you know, I had goals for all time world records, things like that. But uh, you know, those things don't necessarily affect my day-to-day life and, you know, how I feel about my life looking back, but pulling 900 in competition when I've pulled it about a dozen times in the gym kind of does a little bit. So uh, September is the plan. Uh, you know, if the rest of the year, uh, goes smoothly, then we'll, I'll pull the trigger on actually competing in the meet. Uh, but yeah, after that, Courtney, you know, Courtney and I are, were planning on, uh, getting married, uh, early in the year next year. Uh, we weren't going to do it this year because she hates how the year 2023 sounds. <laughs> she's, like, I'm not, she's like, I'm not getting married in 2023. That that year, the, the year sounds awful. So we're going to get married. Roll off the tongue nicely. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you probably dealt with something like that at some point. Uh, so we're going to get married in 2024. Uh, so we're planning, you know, maybe around January or February. And then, yeah, after that, like, who knows? Uh, it would it'd be nice to, you know get healthy and, you know, make sure that we can, you know, start the the process of, you know, starting a family. So I'm going to, you know, like I said, you know, along with, you know, prepping for meets and things like that, I'm not really willing to do, to do the things necessary anymore, or, you know, that's expected to compete at that level. So I'm, I'm a little bit more worried about being healthy and, uh, you know, being able to live my life after that. So, um, uh, but really the, the gym is the, the gym is the top priority right now you know we have uh you know we have this property that i've you know i've showed you you know the the different all the different avenues of potential there for the the property that we're on with the gym uh really just uh focused on you know building the community because we're in a whole different place like we have access to a whole different potential market so uh building the gym community is really my my top priority this year outside of you know potentially competing in september awesome man I love it. I love it. I'll tell you, seeing my gym, how it's grown over the last two years, it exceeded any expectations I may have had. And it, it, it it's a really cool thing. It's a really cool thing being able to give that. And I'll tell you, the space that you have, as soon as I saw it, I was like, pull the trigger. That place is awesome. It's unique. I'm so excited to see what you do with it. And I'm excited to, to hopefully make it out there, yeah. possibly in, in October. Absolutely. So, yeah. Hell yeah, man. So, let everyone know where they can find you on social media, stuff like that. Your gym, your coaching will sign out. Yeah, absolutely. So my, my social media is Bridgeford 242 on Instagram. Uh, the gym is generation strength gym, uh, on Instagram as well. So you can find me on, on both of those. We have a, uh, the generation strength page has a YouTube channel as well, uh, where we have lots of informative content on there. So if you're trying to get better, uh, with any of your powerlifting related things, training wise, whatever technique, we have a lot of awesome content on there that you guys can watch and, you know, learn a thing or two. Uh, yeah, there you go. Hell yeah. Well, Chris, thank you so much. I enjoyed doing this episode and hearing your very long, extensive powerlifting career (laughs) and background. Uh, everyone listening, I hope you guys enjoyed episode number five of the WRPF podcast. Thanks, man.